So an Erev Tov and welcome everyone. Now, before we get into the actual topic of tonight, a general statement about Greek philosophy. So obviously the Greeks who then were ultimately conquered by the Romans who adopted and adapted their philosophy, they were the ones who ultimately destroyed the second temple. So we kind of have a chip on our shoulders in relation to you know, Greek and Roman philosophy and Antiochus and all of those people. But at the, the same time, while well, Hanukkah, remember, ultimately conquering, at least temporarily conquering um, their people, at the same time, the Talmud, the foundation of Jewish rabbinic tradition was being written around the same time as Greek philosophy, um, which had been going on for a few centuries before that. And it was inevitable that Greek and Roman philosophy would make its way into rabbinic thought. Now, the rabbis often denied it. And sometimes they couched it in other formats, but there's no question we were deeply influenced by it, sometimes more apparent than others. Maimonides, who was obviously many centuries later after the fall of the Roman Empire, it was explicitly a student of Aristotle. Now he shifted things. Obviously he rejected the idea of multiple gods and he argued with some pretty fundamental Greek philosophies, but ultimately the rabbis do recognize that there were brilliant things and ideas, both concrete scientific, concrete cultural ones, but also just some ideas about how to understand the world and how to live a good life. And as long as we could couch it within Jewish thought and make it apply to our idea of God and our idea of, of Jewish law, then it was appropriate, even if we didn't explicitly say, oh, we're quoting a Greek philosopher here. So that's one of the things you're going to see tonight. We're going to look at a cracket classic Greek problem or a, a philosophical question that's just fascinating. When you really start to think about it, it's so interesting. And we're going to see that the rabbis in multiple places basically ask the same question and then in a very rabbinic way apply it to practical Jewish law. So the place that we'll start, and again, now this, this uh, philosophical idea may have predated the Greeks. This, I'm just bringing a quote from a Greek philosopher, Plutarch, first century, so a little bit before the Mishnah, but not terribly by much, you know, within 100 years or so of the mission is starting to be written down, um, is telling a story about this man Theseus. Now in mythology, um, again, which is probably based a little on fact and a lot on basically Midrash, Theseus was supposedly the man who founded the ancient Greek city of Athens. And he also did some other amazing things. Some are just, you know, mighty things. Some are supernatural. Regardless, it doesn't really matter. The story is about Theseus and his ship, or it's not really about him. It's just, it could be any person. So here is the story, and it opens up this fascinating thought uh, experiment that we will explore tonight. So Gloria, um, if you would please read this from Plutarch about the ship of Theseus. Shipbuilding. The ship wherein Theseus and the young and the youth of Athens returned had 30 oars and was preserved by the Athenians down even to the time of Demetrius Valerius. For they took away the old planks as they decayed, putting in new and stronger timber in their place, insomuch that this ship became a standing example among the philosophers for the logical question of things that grow, one side holding that the ship remained the same, the other contending that it was not the same. Excellent, thank you. So in terms of the ship that lasted, I think it was about a thousand years, but here's a nice little illustration showing you the idea. So in the beginning of the illustration is the ship of this mythological character Theseus. Now, as the ship got older, it started to break. So they built the ship, he took it out, he went on his journey, and it doesn't even matter the background of the journey. And eventually, you know, a piece of wood here broke. So they took out that piece of wood and they put in a new piece of wood. And then the next year, another different piece of wood broke and so on and so forth until a thousand years later. And this, this illustration actually shows two things. The original ship, every single part of it, from the oars to the glue to the bolts to the wood, everything had been replaced. But all of the pieces that they took out of it were then taken and used to build another ship. So the question is, the ship that had been replaced piece by piece, is that still the original ship? It was considered and treated as the original ship. It looked like the original ship, but every single part about it had changed. And all the original pieces that were built to make this original uh, sailing ship had now made another ship. So is that other ship, the ship of Theseus? And this uh, philosophical question comes up in other variations. Uh, there's a famous one um, about a river. If I go to a river 
a river and I dip my foot in, I touch the water, pull my foot out. And as soon as I put my foot back in, I'm technically touching different water. So can I ever dip my foot into the same river twice? Because water is constantly changing. And also people. Uh, if you didn't know this, that your skin cells, the tiny, and the, the, the Greeks were somewhat familiar with the fact that the universe was made up of atoms, something very tiny that couldn't be divided. Now we know today that even atoms can be divided, but the point is, is that all the cells in my body, pretty much almost all of them, every so often, every couple of years or a couple of weeks, fall away and new ones are born. So the body that I was born with, almost all of it has fallen away and replaced by a new part. Although, just so you don't freak out too much, there's one part of your body that stays the same your entire life from birth to death. Gloria Leonard, do you happen to know what cells are never replaced? Maybe the brain, yeah. Nerve cells, nerve cells. So the essence of who you are stays the same. But the question is, other than my brain, am I still Joel? Every single cell in my hands, are these my hands? Every cell has been replaced. So it's not just an interesting question, it's also a question about who I am. A chair, I use this when I talked in shul. If there's a chair in front of you and you replace a piece, you built a chair with your own two hands and you replace a piece of it every year until every piece has been replaced. Is that still the same chair that you built five, 10 years ago? And what we're gonna do now is see the rabbis again, couched in, hidden in different formats, ask the exact same question. But before we go on, because this is such a mind blowing uh, philosophical question, are there any general questions just to understand this up until now? And then we'll go into the rabbinic exploration of it. Yes, Susan. Susan, you're actually unmuted, so yeah. go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I've heard this, heard about this before. Um, who is the philosopher that um, brought up this question? The, so you this one is a, the, the one that's written right here. It was a general, like there's no specific one who came up with it. Plutarch obviously wrote a history of the, those before okay. him, but I think this was just a popular story, the ship of Theseus. Mm -hmm. The one okay. about sti sticking your feet in the same river twice, I totally forgot who it is. It's someone super duper famous. It might come okay. to me before the end of class, um, but I, I don't believe a specific a philosopher came with this one. Excellent. Any other questions just before we go on? Because as long as you understand up till now, the rest of the class will make sense and how the rabbis explore it. If you're totally lost, it might make sense later and it's okay if it doesn't. Um, beautiful. Okay, so, oh, sorry. So Leonard, if you would please take our first rabbinic source and the rabbis again are gonna explore this very question um, in a few different ways. So the first one is actually about stealing things. And this is actually a very practical law that I've talked about a lot in my little uh, cases in business halakha. So from the Talmud, uh, I, I didn't number the sources, but just this one from Baba Kama, please. Rav Papa said. Rav Papa said, someone who robbed another of dirt and made it into a thick, a brick rather, has not acquired it due to the change. Oh, what is the reason for this? It is, that he can return it and convert it back into, uh, into earth. However, if he robbed another of a brick and by crushing it, uh, turned it into earth, he has acquired it due to the change. If you say perhaps he will return it and fashion it into a brick, this is a different brick and a new entity that we have. Excellent, thank you. So there's a general principle in Jewish law when it comes to theft. Now, if I steal a golden necklace from somebody, put it in my pocket, and then they find me, I have to give that golden necklace back. Now, if I've melted down that golden necklace and I've used it to create something totally different, that golden necklace no longer exists. So I can no longer return the golden necklace I stole. Now, I do have to give something back to the person. I have to give them money based on the value of it. But once, uh, I guess a better example would be if I stole um, you know, somebody's computer and then I sold it you know, into the black market in another country and there's no way to ever get it back. It's impossible to get it back. Um, that person, you know, they can't get the computer back so they get the money. But if I've basically taken an object out of existence by changing it so that it no longer exists, I don't have to give it back. And the rabbis talk about if I take something from someone and change it into a new entity, it's no longer the original thing that belongs to that person. Someone points to it and says, but that's, you, you may have melted down my gold, but that was my gold necklace. And the rabbis say, no, 
once something has been sufficiently changed, it's as if your necklace has been destroyed, no longer exists. Now, you still get money back because somebody stole something of value from you. But again, the rabbis here are being explicit. Once something is so changed that it's no longer at all, it's no longer possible to turn it back. It's as if it doesn't exist anymore and you can't be given it back. So the practical example here is if I take somebody's dirt or cement, I guess, and make a brick, I can break it down and give them, give them back dirt. But if I take somebody's brick and I break it down into dirt and then say, well, so just make them a brick again, the rabbis say, no, it has changed so much. It's a brand new brick. It's no longer the brick you stole. And therefore, all you have to give back to the person is the value of it. And that's, by the way, practical Jewish law. I don't know how much it comes up today, but the rabbis have to be real. Look, if you steal somebody and you're like, look, everything I stole from you, I destroyed or lost, and it's just gone out of existence. So you don't have to find those things. You pay them back the money. But our takeaway here is the rabbis recognize that something can be so changed, it's as if it doesn't exist anymore. Even though technically it might, the atoms are still there. Once it's different, it's a brand new thing. And Rambam here in his Mishnah Torah, Yara Chazakai is a couple of names for it, uh, is going to spell this out. And Leonard, I'll let you take this one as, uh, this one as well, because it's a short one. A change, please. A change that can revert to its original state is not considered to be a change. How does this manifest? When a person obtains boards by robbery and attack, atta attaches them to each other with nails and makes a box, that is not considered a change for it is possible to separate them and make them simple boards as they were previously. Excellent, thank you. So if we're gonna apply this to our philosophical question, it seems with, with some questions, like the new ship of Theseus is a totally new entity. Now you could argue based on this, well, you still have a ship and that's all that matters. It doesn't matter what makes it, it matters you have a ship, but here, if you take away the essence of something and replace it with something else as if it's, it's, an, as if it's a new thing. So um, Susan, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. And we have a few more rabbinic sources that are gonna um, explore this idea of, again, replacing, and this is even more relevant. This is replacing something piece by piece. And the question is, is it the same thing? And the background to this that the rabbis will explain, or at least the translation, is that impurity or tuma, which again, practically what tuma means is if somebody has this tuma, their impurity on them, they can't bring sacrifices, they can't go into the temple, it limits what they can do in the religious sphere. So if somebody comes in, a, which is why a Kohen, a priest, can't go near a dead body except for their immediate family, because if a Kohen comes into contact with a dead body and they're impure, they can't do their job in the temple. So in general, we need to be very careful and very aware of what uh, what around us can impart impurity. And there's a general idea that it's not just a body that has died, animal or human, that impurity can spread onto certain objects. A bed can be impure. A house can be impure. Certain objects can be impure. So the idea here is that a bed has impurity. So the question is, are that, what are some of the ways that we can get rid of that impurity so that you can lie on that bed and then go bring the Pesach sacrifice the next day? So Susan, please, and this is going back to the Mishnah. Okay, a bed that has contracted Midrash impurity. And Midrash, sorry, what... Midrash means like pressing down on, meaning somebody laid okay. down on it through pressure okay. and transfer. Okay. okay, thank you. If alongside of it was broken and then he repaired it, it still retains its Midrash impurity. If the second side was also broken and then he repaired it, it becomes pure for Midrash impurity. But it but is unclean by virtue of contract with Midras. If before one could manage to repair the first side, second one broke, the bed becomes clean. Excellent. Thank you. So again, you have your bed here, part of the bed breaks, and then you replace it. So by replacing part of it, um, uh, it, it removes some of the impurity, but there's still a little bit there. But if basically the entire bed is replaced, the whole thing breaks and you replace it all, any of that in uncleanness any of that ritual spiritual impurity is gone because it went with the original pieces of the bed. And even though it's still, you know, you are at Su Susan's bed, it's the bed that you built the same way, it's still the same Ikea bed, the bed you're comfortable in, technically speaking, the rabbis recognize this is a new entity. And whatever impurity it is has either dissipated, disappeared into the universe, or it's with the broken pieces over there in the corner. 
So while technically you look at it and say, that's my bed, that's the bed I'm sleeping in tonight, on a fundamental level, by replacing the pieces of something, even one at a time, it really is a brand new thing. And that actually leads us to our, um, it's not the last source for this class, but the last source from the Talmud. And Elizabeth, I will unmute you here. And welcome, Tamar, hello. Um, this is probably the single most famous source uh, relating to this conversation. Now, there's a lot of technical jargon in here. Um, however, first of all, you'll recognize some of the things they talk about, because it's like, oh, that's kind of like the bed we just talked about. Um, and ultimately, you'll, you'll pick up, based on what we said, this idea of something breaking a piece at a time, and does it become something new that never existed before, or is it the same darn thing? So Elizabeth, please, from the Talmud Ravli Erevin, Rabbi Yochanan, his student, said to him. Rabbi Yochanan said, uh, his students said to him, Master, you taught us that with regard to a sandal that became ritually impure by impure, impurity imparted by the threading of a zav. And, and a zav is just somebody who, without going into details, something came out of their body that wasn't supposed to be coming out and they're considered impure. And again, that means they can't offer sacrifices, go in the temple. But again, anything they touch, they can give their ritual spiritual impurity to and then depending on the object, it can transfer to multiple people. So you got to be really careful about what you touch and who touches it. But the Zav person wore your sandals. He wore your Adidas. Now, what are you going to do with the Adidas, please? And one of its ears, that is straps, broke and he repaired it. It remains ritually impure with impurity imparted by treading midras and can still render people and utensils ritually impure. If one of a sandal straps is torn, it can still be used as a sandal and therefore it does not lose its status as a utensil. If the second ear broke and he repaired it, it is ritually pure in the sense that it no longer renders other objects ritually impure as would a vessel that became a primary source of ritual impurity by means of impurity imparted, imparted by treading. So pause there at the word however. So there's a few things going on here. One of the things they're talking about is that something becomes so broken that it's no longer the thing anymore, that it loses, all that spiritual stuff goes away because in the universe, a sandal became impure. If a small part of the sandal broke, but you're like, you're repairing a sandal, you're just repairing a strap of the sandal, it's still a sandal, it's still impure. But at the point where you've had to, it's so broken that it's no longer a sandal, yes, you could repair it, but there's a moment in time where it's so broken that is no longer a sandal, then it's impossible to say that the sandal that became impure still exists. Something can become so broken as though it just, it doesn't exist anymore. Oh, how are your Adidas sandals? Well, they broke and I couldn't use them. Therefore they don't exist. So what Adidas sandals are you talking about? I know that sounds absurd, but that's basically what they're saying there is that if, if it has to be repaired so many times, it's as if the original sandals are out of existence. Again, going back to that ship, uh, the rabbis would say, no, the new ship that's been replaced piece by piece by piece by piece, it's a new ship. You could call it the ship of Theseus, but it's the ship of Theseus 2.0. So if you replace or you repair sandals, every single part of it, the original sandals are gone and any spiritual impair, uh, impurity that were in the original sandals has flown away. Please continue at however. However, the sandal itself is richly impure due to contact with an object that became richly impure with impurity imparted by the treading, that is the sandal before its second strap ripped. Therefore, it can transmit ritual impurity to food and liquids. And you said about this halacha, what is different in a case where the first ear breaks that the sandal remains impure? It is because the second one is intact. However, when the second ear breaks, the first ear is intact. So how does the sandal lose its utensil status? And then you said to us with regard to this, that the reason it is no longer utensil is because a new entity has arrived here. The legal status of the sandal with the two repaired ears is not that of the original sandal. It is a new sandal. So pause there for a moment before here too. So again, they're saying a couple of things here. First of all, they're making some technical distinctions that we won't go into. They're saying there's different kinds of impurity and one of them disappears, but one of them is technically there because look, you still have the original material. So that original material sucked up some impurity. But again, if 
by saying that the, the original sandal no longer exists, it loses some of the impurity. We don't need to go into that distinction. The whole point here is this, once you've changed something so much, you've repaired it so many times, again, it's as if you made a brand new thing and the original thing is disappeared from existence. Now, again, would you apply that to a person? Maybe, even though the neurons in our brain are still the same ones, every single other cell in our body has been replaced. So technically, am I a completely different person? And it sounds like from, even though they're, they're only talking technically about ritual impurity, they're clearly exploring the idea of what does it mean to be? What does it mean to have the identity of something? What does it mean to be an object in the world? And if you keep changing yourself, eventually you're no longer the same thing. Your identity has changed. So am I still Joel? Depends on what you mean by being Joel. Am I still the same stuff? For the most part, no. So continue with here too. Here too. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Yeah, go ahead. Here too, with regard to a utensil that was perforated several times, where the sum of all the holes add up to the size of a pomegranate, let us say that a new entity has arrived here. As the entire area of the hole is completely new and the utensil is no longer the same utensil that had been ritually impure, Ezekiel was so impressed by Rabbi Yochanan's comment that he exclaimed about him, this is not a human being, rather he is an angel and he is capable of resolving a problem that I struggle with from something that I myself taught. Sorry, excuse me. Okay, good to dance here. Some say that he said this is an ideal human being. This you can actually, you, well, you can stop there. So the case they talked about before is again, a bag. You get a little hole in the bag, you patch it up. But again, if you have so many holes in the bag, it's not a bag anymore. And if you patch it up, you basically made a brand new bag. So it's just the same idea. The last line here just refers back to the section before this. They were talking about building an Aru, very relevant to, 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 the, to the east side. But they're saying if you replace uh, the fence a little bit at a time, it's as if you created a brand new fence that was never there before. Um, but the point is here is they recognize that this problem is so out there, so abstract, so impossible to understand that anybody who could figure it out is obviously they're like, beyond the beyond. They're absolutely brilliant, essentially a philosopher, as it were. And the final uh, actual source that we have here, even though there are many more we could explore, is a relatively contemporary article um, written by a, a Rabbi Mark Steiner. Um, and this is from uh, Yeshiva University, a great article there. Um, and he's talking, I mean, the context here is talking about one of the great recent rabbis who talked about how to be an ethical Jew, Rabbi Salanter but he uses that as a vehicle for talking about philosophy. And he's gonna talk about some of this Greek um, philosophy. So he says, for a simple example, like anything is simple here, consider the ancient Greek debate about change and becoming. Opinions on the subject range from that of Heraclitus, who held that one cannot take a step into the same river twice. That's what I was thinking of before. He's the one who says, you can't take a step in the same river twice because the river keeps the water and that river is constantly moving through. Also, you, the person, your body keeps changing. So different river, different person, because new waters are always flowing upon you. To Parmenides, who held that change is an illusion, even in the case of a river. We're not going to go there. Um, although what he is saying is, look, even though the cells in your body change, the river is constantly changing. Look, it's still the same river. It's still the, the Colorado River. And yes, the skin cells in your body change. But look, come on, you're still the same person you are. So two very extreme uh, opinions on it explored uh, by the Greeks. The question crucially depends upon the concept of identity through time. Whether we think of the can think of the river as the same, as persisting through time, even though the waters coursing through it may be different, depending on what you mean by different. Now the Talmud asked almost the very same question as we just read together. Um, very same question, though camouflaging it in legal terminology, again, because the rabbis generally didn't want to quote idolatrous paganistic cultures, even if they had great ideas. If one worships, so this is something we actually didn't read. If one worships or prostrates, bows himself before a spring of water, uh, are the waters of that spring made unfit to be offered as libation? So there's a general idea, a tree. Tree's just a tree. But as soon as idolaters start worshiping that tree, that tree becomes forbidden. It becomes an idolatrous tree. And that tree doesn't really change. But what if they worship a river? 
and that river becomes a, and you have this in certain cultures. They believe they're gods or spirits of rivers. So somebody bows down to the river. Oh, I can't use that water. It's idolatrous now, except the water that that person just bowed to is now 75 miles that way. So the question is, do I say that the water that was there at the second they bowed is forbidden? Or is it just the idea of the river again? Gloria, is it the same Gloria that she was when she was 12 years old? Or you know, does it just because Gloria is an idea? Or are we talking about the stuff that makes up the Gloria? Really big questions out there, but to us you'll always be Gloria, whichever that means. Um, is the water before him that he worshiped, which is no longer there, or is it the entire stream of water that he worshiped? And it mentions the, the source there of Odazara. Question is not simply one of the idolaters intentions, since there's no way to determine that. So when you ask somebody, did you worship the water that was there at the second, or did you worship the whole river? And most people don't think about the world that way. They just do the action. Rather, the question is philosophical. Whether or not the spring itself is an object, which persists through time, and therefore could be the object of worship. We have here the beginning of an ontological discussion, just how do you understand the world? How do you, you know, talk about the world? Despite the ostensible hostility of the Talmud to philosophy or Greek wisdom that I mentioned before, questions of identity permeate the halachic literature. The rabbis had to decide when and whether two idols are the same deity. And at what point a sandal undergoing alterations, that was the Talmud we read, becomes a different sandal. Identity questions can decide even questions of kashrut, and I'll, I'll give you a practical example of that. If somebody takes a piece of pork, it's not kosher, it's forbidden by the Torah. But if they take that pork and they, they melt it down and burn it down and mix it through 57 chemicals, so every atom in it, every molecule is going to completely change. Even though you started with it, there's no way that you could ever, there's no way to return it to being a piece of pig. The question is, is that still considered pork? And why is that relevant? Because that pork that's been changed is often used to make gelatin, which often makes gummy bears. So in America, no rabbi says that it's fine. Every rabbi says, no, it's still considered pork. But in Israel, a lot of rabbis say it's so different. And look at the Talmud. They said when something is so completely changed, it's as if it's a brand new thing. So this idea has very, very specific and relevant applications today to Jewish law. And I mentioned actually before, if somebody takes a vow, an oath, they swear, I swear I'm never going to sit in that chair ever again. Well, then again, every year I replace a leg, a piece of wood of the chair. So every original piece of that chair that was there when I made the vow is gone, is replaced. Can I sit in the chair now? When I said I swear I won't sit in the chair, did I mean the actual pieces of wood there? Or do I mean the idea of that chair in my mind? And again, most people don't think about the world that way, but the rabbis in the Talmud do. So whatever you think about this question, and remember again, for people, your, your, um, your, uh, your neurons are the same, so it doesn't completely rely to people, but it's really relevant to our world. If you go back to a rock or a river that you visited as a kid, is it the same rock or river? And at the end of the day, maybe it doesn't matter for most things. What matters is how I experience it. And the chair, it feels the same when I sit in it. The boat, the ship of Theseus, it sails the same. All this stuff experientially doesn't matter, but sometimes for the rabbis, when you really dig in deep, it can have relevant things. And the question is, were the rabbis coming up with those ideas because of uh, it, it was born out of Jewish law, or did the Greek philosophy inspire them? And they said, oh, that's a crazy idea that things can change and be a totally brand new thing that might influence Jewish law. So it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. No rabbi will admit that Jewish law is influenced by it, but it's pretty clear um, that it had some influence. And these questions, again, are still relevant today.